Let me welcome to the stage Hadi Husseini, assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. He's a computational neuroscientist and is uh, trying to develop personalized interventions that are uh, informed by computational strategies. Hello, thanks Lara for the inviting me actually to here and thanks for the uh, organizers to uh, put together such a unique uh, summit. So today I'm going to talk about uh, neuromonitoring guided cognitive intervention and but before that I just want to overview yeah, the state of like the psychiatric diagnosis and at the same time what we know about the brain. So as you learned during the past two days actually that uh, mental disorders are usually uh, diagnosed by a set of behavioral or psychological uh, indications. What we know about uh, those, uh, what we call them uh, mental disorders, ADHD, autism, and so on, we know that a lot of risk factors are contributing to those disorders. You learn a, a lot about them, like how genetic factors may influence them, how sleep uh, uh, disorders may influence them, stress, uh, prenatal factors, and so on. But uh, we don't really know much about uh, the etiology of these disorders. So these are disorders that are defined at the behavioral level. We know these factors are influencing them, but we don't really know much about the link uh, between these two. And in my opinion, I think it will take years and years until we actually uh, bridge that gap. But what we know in the past several decades with the help uh, of actually the advances in uh, neuroimaging technology and computational uh, uh, approaches, we've learned a lot about what circuits are affected by these disorders. Uh, my, my work, including and then other colleagues, have uh, tried to actually kind of like map the circuits that are affected uh, in each of these disorders. And in the past, as I said, two decades, there's like uh, tens of thousands of studies that are trying to find the linkage between the maps that are affected in different circuits and uh, uh, and, and the disorders. So I think so, in the, uh, so the next step in that uh, direction is that instead of uh, defining mental disorders at the behavioral level, uh, if you're familiar with the movie Inception, we can basically go one level down uh, and then basically try to redefine all those disorders at the brain circuit level. That, that's not the ultimate solution, but that's just kind of like one step ahead. But, that, but more importantly is that how we can basically translate those knowledge, so we know these circuits are affected, how we can translate those knowledge and then to re redefine treatments. So the work in my lab, uh, my day-to-day -day job actually is uh, uh, computational brain research and intervention. The main part of it is basically trying to find these connectome level signatures of brain disorders and we have published a lot in uh, understanding how these uh, uh, just large scale network level uh, 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 networks are, are affected actually uh, in different disorders. But the ultimate goal uh, for uh, my research is that how we can really use this knowledge uh, or to inform the interventions. Uh, and for that, I've been trying to basically link uh, what we call uh, uh, neuroimaging with basically some of the available interventions. The interventions that um, uh, we have been using different technologies, uh, computerized interventions, virtual reality, and so on, but with the help of real-time imaging. I'm focusing on cognitive uh, uh, abilities mainly, and the reason for that is that it's basically cross-diagnostic. If you think about executive functions, working memory, attention, all of those functions are affected irrespective of what mental disorders you have. So, so we're basically taking a very uh, cross-diagnostic approach. So one of the exciting projects that we're doing is basically, as I said, trying to link in neuroimaging with uh, uh, cognitive intervention is that we use real-time neuroimaging with multivariate pattern analysis to try basically to localize the target that we are uh, going to uh, uh, improve and then at the same time monitor the activity in that region and then combine it or integrate it with a cognitive training to see how we can basically engage that network. And for that, 
So we're using near infrared spectroscopy, which is a, a, a more cost-effective version of, uh, I would say, fMRI. It's, it has less spatial resolution, but it has a very uh, ecological validity and can be used in clinical po population very easily. So we're, we're using NIRS for neural monitoring, and then at the same time, uh, we're using uh, computerized cognitive training to see if we can engage the network uh, that we're interested in. Specifically, we're focusing on working memory training here. So we have tested this first in uh, individuals actually who were healthy, and uh, we found actually very interesting results. So after four sessions of intervention, when we had two groups, uh, one group who, who did the uh, real basically intervention and the other group was controls. So uh, we found actually significant uh, modulation of brain activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is involved actually in the working memory and executive functions, and at the same time improved performance compared with control. We have been testing this in children with ADHD. Uh, we have some preliminary data that are very promising. So, so what are the next steps? I'm going to just share with you quickly three uh, projects that uh, we're uh, doing in line with, the, the, with, with this actually direction of research. So the first, uh, the first project that we're working on now is basically how we can translate this uh, 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 new intervention actually to uh, uh, to homes because it's, it's very hard. So for, for me, like I need to bring this, for example, kids with ADHD for 10 sessions. They're doing this neuromonitoring guided cognitive intervention and then it takes a lot of resources. So what we're doing now is we're working on trying to make a system, a near system, that's actually much cheaper than what the available commercial systems so we can then basically uh, uh, integrate it with some uh, uh, cognitive training and then individuals can actually bring it home and then uh, uh, work on it. And the, the NIRS actually technology has been around for 10, 20 years. Uh, these are the studies that showed, for example, the mapping between functional NIRS and fMRI. There's a great, basically, uh, uh, agreement between the signals that you get. So this is the signal that you get in fMRI with, ac across different tasks. And then that's the signal that you get with NIRS. So, but, but most of the actually available technologies out there is like, like between 20K to 500K actually. So the near systems that we have in the lab are usually around 100K, but this is, the technology itself is not really expensive. It's just you can make a system that can cost like just 100 bucks. And it works much better than EEG, and the reason is that so you don't really de deal with like a lot of noises that you need to uh, clean up with EEG. Uh, you know the signal that you get is basically the signal that you, from the sensors at detector that you're actually probing. So you don't need to actually do the uh, 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 reverse problem solving. So the next uh, other project that I've been uh, working on again around uh, cognitive augmentation is basically uh, uh, focused on aging. So as we know, uh, previous speakers actually, Laura, I think, talked about the, the cognitive decline. But what's more interesting uh, around cognitive decline is that the amount, the percentage of actually cortical change that we have by aging. So the, the, this, the, this, this brain imaging actually shows that we are, depending on the region, we are actually losing up to 0.8% of cortical gray matter, okay, every year, from 55 years old to 90 years old. If you, if you hit with actually MCI or, uh, or Alzheimer's, this rate is actually tripled or twice or actually two times to five times more. So we, know, oh, we all know that there is no actually kind of like treatment for Alzheimer's or MCI. So uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the idea behind cognitive augmentation is that, so if you can just delay the onset of the AD by five years, and this is, this is, uh, this is from uh, Alzheimer's Association, we can actually reduce the uh, prevalence of uh, AD in 2050 by 43%. So just imagine if you can just and the, the premise of cognitive intervention is that if you can just basically improve cognitive reserve or brain reserve a little bit so that if the individual hits with a, a, a pathology basically when it, it goes down and hit that clinical uh, uh, diagnosis level just later we can basically kind of like they've solved a, a, some, some, of, some part of the problem. Again, this is not a treatment, it's just kind of like trying to delay the onset of the disorder. And 
so we have been, uh, th there's a lot of data actually uh, on healthy aging, but at, in, in MCI, there are a few actually showing that how the brain actually changes in response to training. We have, we have been trying to understand actually to, to decode actually how these kinds of training and brain networks in, uh, uh, interact and so on. And then we are trying to actually to personalize this intervention for healthy uh, older adults. And again, another li line of interest is on the stroke patients. Uh, again, like this uh, functional neuron spectroscopy is actually has a great potential to be used in uh, functional stroke recovery. Uh, we have been collecting data simultaneously with near sun fMRI and stroke patients, trying to see if we can validate uh, uh, sensitive changes in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the stroke uh, patients, actually. Because one of the problems uh, see, that I see is that if someone hits with a stroke, then it takes a while until someone can feel any sensible feedback regarding like motor functions. And you don't really know if, if for example, the rehabilitation is going to work or not. And we're going to hear from Gary Steinberg, uh, I think in the next talk, more about this, uh, the general, the stroke. But I think it has a very great potential in terms of informing clinicians to direct the treatment and at the same time uh, uh, to actually also use it in a neuromonitoring guided intervention. And thank you.